Well, good morning. Welcome to Church at Home with Glory Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Chris Myros, and I'm so glad that you've taken some time out of your weekend to join us for worship today. It is a great day to be praising the Lord and celebrating, and I'm going to share a few things with you. Uh, we'll start off with just a few informational items, and then I'm going to read some scripture to you, and then we will hop on into the sermon. As far as informational items, we do have a church bulletin, and you can find that online at akinchurch.com, A-I-T-K-I-N church.com, and you can download that, that bulletin as well as previous week's bulletins if you would like to see some of the information there. While you're on the church's website, uh, we do have a place there for online giving. Uh, you can give through that. It's a safe, secure site, and that allows us to continue the operations of the church, and we appreciate your tithes and your offerings and your generosity that allows us to continue to spread the good news of Jesus Christ into the world. Uh, God has blessed us, and we want to be a blessing to others, and we thank you for partnering with us, and uh, we look forward to uh, what God has in store for the rest of this year. And so that is uh, truly a blessing to be able to be part of a church where where we are moving forward and doing great things to God's glory, despite the challenges at times of being socially distanced, um, God is still at work. And, and the truly, truly amazing things I think are going to be said following this time of how God ministered in the world, despite our challenges in social distancing. On that note, our church council will be meeting um, coming up this week, talking about when it is that we perhaps as a church can begin regathering um, physically at our church building for Sunday morning worship. There's a lot of things that have to be discussed and a lot of decisions that have to be made, so we'll just invite you to pray for us that we would have wisdom as we work our way through that. Nobody more than me wants to get back together and, and gather together and be with one another, but nobody more than me wants to uh, make a mistake and do that wrong, in the wrong way, at the wrong time. Um, I have a couple of pastor friends who have one two weeks ago and one last week. Their churches started meeting. Neither of them are here in Minnesota. And uh, both of those pastors have had COVID-19 positive tests within their congregation and had to re-shut down their churches again for the next couple of weeks after having only one or two services. And so... It's a difficult challenge to decide when the right time is for that, and, and that's what we're going to be working through. We do know locally some churches have already started. Some churches aren't going to start for a while, and that's not an easy process. So do keep us in prayer. We are working on that, and uh, we hope to have uh, some future dates set for you uh, so that we have something that we will be working towards. And as soon as we know something, we will let you know about that. Beyond that, uh, pray for all the things that are going on in the world. Everything with the COVID-19 crisis uh, has a huge impact here in America. But if you think of the impact it has here, think of the impact it has across the globe. Uh, there's places where it's just starting to actually spread, um, particularly in places along the equator where they don't have medical facilities and supplies and technology and all the things that we have. Um, and so pray for pray for those places. Pray for those who minister in those places. We have many ministry partners, uh, both as a church, but as well as Converge, that minister in these areas of the world. And, and it's definitely going to be a challenging season of sharing the gospel in, in many of these uh, places outside of America. So pray for our missionaries and those we partner with as well. And then just lots of other things going on, of course, with um, all the things that have been happening and related to... Uh, riots and protests in the Twin Cities and political unrest and, and other protests across the world. There, there's a whole lot of things in the world that, that people are really struggling with. And uh, there's a lot for us to think over, a lot for us to examine, a lot for us to examine our hearts about. And if you need some safe place to converse, I'm here for that. I'm here for you. Um, if you'd like to talk more, understand more, hear more, hear my thoughts about it, I'd love to share with you. Sunday morning is not the time right now for me to do all of that. But uh, if you would like to know more or like to converse more, 
uh, I, I certainly would be willing to be part of that process with you. But more than anything, we need to be a people of prayer in this season, praying for our world, praying for our nation, praying for our leaders, praying for our church, praying for our church leaders, praying for one another. And with that, in our church bulletin is a prayer list and a number of things that we certainly can be in prayer for and should be in prayer for, including the missionaries that I already mentioned, our family of the week, uh, Verna Rogers, Toots, as many of us know her. She's our, our family of the week. Um, the, the ongoing prayer concerns of people with health concerns and uh, the, the praises, actually, of, of uh, children that are about to be born, both in our immediate church family and our extended church family, but also mourning with families who have lost loved ones recently, uh, praying over that as well. There's a couple of very specific prayer requests uh, within all of that that I wanted to share with you here, and then we will enter into a time of prayer. Um, the first one is Gloria Carlson is in uh, Duluth. Um, she had had a stroke, and so she's up there doing some recovery work, and that information has been sent out on, on the church prayer list, and if you'd like to know more about that or, or how to contact Gloria, uh, contact Ruth Eggstead, and she can get you that information. But do be in prayer for Gloria uh, as she goes through this. That's always a, a difficult time, and, and so keep her in your prayers. Continue to lift up Russ Gilbertson. Just pray. He's got some blood tests coming up this week. Uh, pray for Russ and, and most all of us who are hearing my voice right now know Russ and, and love Russ and, and uh, pray for Russ because that's certainly challenging and frightening for him and uh, his family. So so pray for Russ that uh, that would begin to get sorted out and they could begin to have some clarity because this has been going on for a while um, and they don't know what is going on. So just pray for that. And then the final one is, is kind of a personal one. Um, right before, you, you may know, we've been on vacation as a family this past week. Um, and so right before we left, my wife discovered she'd been bitten by a tick. And it was a deer tick. And uh, she does have uh, uh, what appears to be the large red bullseye on her leg where it occurred. And she is on antibiotics now, but um, the concern, of course, with deer tick bites is always Lyme disease, and when we live up here where we live, that's a constant presence and threat, I guess, and many of us know somebody who has it or has gone through it, and um, so it's been a tough year for my wife, health-wise, and uh, we've been praying for her ear and the healing in her ears and all the problems there. We really didn't want this, but I guess that's... Uh, what we are going through. So if you would keep her in prayer, we would appreciate that as well. So with that, uh, just going to enter into a brief time of prayer, and then I'm going to read some scripture that relates to our sermon today, and we will carry on with the sermon. Thanks again for joining us. I'm so glad that you were here today. Let's pray. God, you are good, and we are humbled and amazed at your great love for us, and so thankful that you are in relationship with us. And we just pray in this moment for all the things said and things that weren't said, things that are listed, but things that are also private. Uh, God, you know all of our prayer requests, and we lift them up to you. Lord, we pray for all of those health concerns and many others. Um, we pray, God, for our world and just the strife that is ever-present currently, particularly in our country with with politics and, and race and illness and all the things that are going on, God, we know you are greater than this. And God, we know you didn't intend for the world to be broken as it is, but it is indeed broken. And we know, God, the only way for healing in this world is through you. And God, we pray for your presence to be apparent in this world and, and that you would lead us to lead in love as we go about our lives. May we lead with love. May we find ways to serve. May we find places to be generous. May we find ways to make a difference. May we stand up for the weak. May we be the ones who indeed are your hands and feet. God, we thank you for the opportunity to do that. We thank you that you would partner with us. We thank you that you would empower us for that work. And God, wherever you might send us this week, may we do all of this to your glory, honor, and praise. Lord, we lift up to you all the others who are just hurting emotionally, physically, mentally, spiritually. There's so much in this world that you did not intend for it to be, but yet it is because of our sin. And so, God, 
We pray against all of that. And God, uh, continue to pour your generosity upon us, not that we might hoard it for ourselves, but that we might be a funnel channeling your blessing to others, sharing it with others, and using it as a way to point others to you. God, again, we just thank you for all that you have done and all that you will do for us. Continue to be with us, watching over us, blessing us, keeping us, protecting us, and providing for us so that we might know, love, and serve you each and every day you would give us breath. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' high and holy and beautiful name. Amen. Well, thanks again for praying with me, and uh, I'm going to read some scripture here for you, and then we will get underway with our sermon. Today I'm going to read a little bit longer passage than the past couple of weeks, and that passage comes again from uh, Genesis 1. If you don't know where Genesis is, it's the very first book of your Bible. If you've got a Bible, feel free to open that up. If you don't, uh, you can use version on your phone, on your iPad, on your computer, any digital device. Uh, version, um, the Bible app, is, is a great tool for reading your Bible, even during worship, but on a day-by-day -day basis. It's the Bible I probably use very most in my life. Even as a pastor, I use my digital Bible an awful lot. So we're going to be in Genesis 1. I'm going to read uh, verses 1 through 31. They're talking about the creation of the world. Feel free to follow along. It says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. Verse 6. And God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above this expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening, and there was morning, the second day. Verse 9. And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together in one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit, which is in their seed, or which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth br brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seeds according to their own kind, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the third day. Verse 14. And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years, and let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made uh, the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And, and God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. Verse 20. And God said, Let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures. Let the birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves, with which the waters swarm, according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. Verse 24. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things, and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. 
Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. Verse 28. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and every bird of the heavens, and everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Well, welcome to our sermon series from the book of Genesis. What I'd like to do today is, is give you an overview of the creation days. There really is so much here that we could spend a tremendous amount of time in it. One of my seminary professors uh, said to our class that he could spend a whole year teaching just the first 12 chapters of Genesis and we would never run out of material. Now, I'm obviously not that smart. So we'll get through it a whole lot faster than that. But suffice it to say that this portion of Scripture is filled with, with, with beautiful things, and they have a direct connection with how we live in the world today. The first two verses of Genesis brought us face to face with the ultimate reality, the personal creator God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. The, the remainder of the chapter displays for us God's sovereignty in creation. Today I want to overview the context and, and the lessons of, of the six days of creation. Uh, the next week I would like to look at with you in maybe a little bit more in-depth way at the sixth day specifically, since it's so important for us to understand that and, and what, it, what it means for us as mankind. But, but before we do so, we need to at least, you know, make a a passing reference to the, the nature of the creation days because there's been a, a great deal of controversy, uh, particularly in, in the last 50 or 60 years, um, even in evangelical circles, about the nature of these days. Now, let me say that historically, the church has always viewed these days to be literal days. Speaking of the same kind of days that you and I know about, 24-hour days. But within the last 150 or so years, uh, even within evangelical circles, there has been um, considerable difference in discussion about the nature of these days. In church history prior to about 150 years ago, you, you can almost name on one hand um, the, the, the people who viewed these days as anything other than literal days, anything other than six natural 24-hour days. Uh, but among them are some heavy hitters, certainly. Um, included in, in, in the ranks of those who did not see this as a, a literal 24-hour day um, would be the likes of Augustine, um, incredibly influential uh, theologian from church history, um, some would include in that list uh, Thomas Aquinas. Um, so so some, some pretty sizable names that you may have, if you studied any church history, you may have heard those names before. Um, August, Augustine is, is one of the, or Augustine, is, is one of the more interesting ones to examine as to why it is that he believed as he believed. Um, if you know his theology, he, he he, under, he, he thought of the books of the Apocrypha uh, as being scriptural, so he included those in his Bible. Um, we, we as Protestants don't, but our, our Catholic and Orthodox uh, brothers and sisters do still use those books. But, but within that, there's a book called The Wisdom of Ben Sirach. 
and, and it's oftentimes called uh, Ecclesiasticus, not at all to be confused with Ecclesiastes. Those are two very separate, different books. But in that book, there's a phrase which asserts that, that God created the world instantaneously. And Augustine really felt a tension with the sixth day and then this book that says that it was instantaneous. And so he, he felt almost a duty, an obligation to somehow square those teachings of the apocryphal book um, with the scriptural account. Um, and so that's kind of where he goes and, and that's where his theology comes from. And then in his response and his attempt to harmonize those two views, um, that, that was, you know, as he did that, he, he argued that the world had been created instantaneously and then that the, the six days was merely a, a literary device that the Lord had developed to explain the way in which he had created the world. So, so that was his attempt to harmonize those two stories. Um, but other than him and, and a few others, most everyone else in the history of the church up until about 150 years ago accepted, as we read this beginning of Genesis, those days to be six literal days. And of course, the reason that these new theories, for whether it's six days as literal days or not, the reason those the new theories have proliferated, pr proliferated is because of the advances of modern science, of paleontology, uh, of human anthropology, uh, archaeology, and, and other things, and geology, um, and other various sciences have all kind of pushed this issue so that people had to really begin rethinking about, well, what, what does it actually mean? And then, of course, since the time of Darwin, um, that, that has accelerated uh, at a great pace. Um, Darwin, of course, uh, and his views of, of the history of the world, so to speak, um, and geology, was, was really a shift in thinking across the globe, frankly. And, and whether we agree with his thinking or not, we do have to acknowledge that it was a, a significant impact and since his time, uh, scientists ha have largely been of the belief now that that the world is very, very old, right? Uh, millions and millions, if not billions and billions of years old. And, and because of that, um, they feel then that, that the biblical account of creation um, doesn't square with what they think scientifically. And so because of those contrasting ideas and worldviews and, and beliefs and philosophies and all the stuff that comes into play with that, evangelicals began to attempt to try to come up with some way to, to harmonize the accounts uh, of the six days of creation uh, with these vast ages that were being proposed by modern science. And, and because of that, various theories came out uh, figurative interpretations of these days. And I'll, I'll talk about a few of those here. And the first of those theories is one you may have heard of. It's called the gap theory. Uh, Thomas Chalmers, who, who was a minister in the, uh, the Free Church of Scotland, popularized this idea. And the gap theory suggests that there was a, a, a vast stretch of time be between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. And, and some have even... Uh, proliferated that theory to argue that there were even gaps between each individual day, uh, not just the first and the second, but, but beyond that, uh, to really lengthen out that timeline. That, that God created in a day, and then there may have been millions and millions of years, and then he created another day, and then perhaps there was millions and millions of more, you know, and you get the idea, right? Um, and, and that was an attempt to to accommodate the days of Genesis 1 with the modern theories that, that have come up in, in, in science primarily. Now, of course, there are, there are obvious weaknesses to that view. And I don't want to go into all of those now. Uh, but, but all of these 
are worth studying. Even if you don't agree with them, they're all worth studying so you can understand how much of the rest of the world thinks. If you're interested and you never ever need some resources on those, I could certainly point you uh, towards some of those. The second theory is a theory called the day-age theory. Um, that is basically a, a theory that says the days in Genesis 1 are actually not 24-hour days. Uh, they are long ages or epochs, as some, as some would call it. Um, and, and, and there was an a, attempt to accommodate these ages with the teaching of modern science. And so if each day is actually referring to an age, you can some way, shape, or form begin to explain away the, the, the time difference between science, so to speak, as some would feel, and, and then the Bible. Now, of course, the problem is the structure of the six days of Genesis. Uh, of, uh, let me try that again. The six days of Genesis, um, the structure there really doesn't bear any relation um, to that account that modern science is trying to give it. So, so even if you give vast ages to the six Genesis days, it really doesn't do a good job uh, of harmonizing them with modern science. And so that's not probably one of the, the, the better theories that's out there, but it's one that, that has at times had traction. Uh, once again, it comes from a, a well-meaning attempt to harmonize science and the scriptures. And, and we can acknowledge that it's a well-meaning attempt. Um, Bible-believing people trying to harmonize it because they want all truth to harmonize with itself, both the truth of, of, of general revelation as well as the truth of special revelation. But again, with this one particular, it seems like it it really flops. It, it, it just doesn't really work. Then there's been more recently a view of the days um, called a literary view, or, um, or the literary day theory is what it's sometimes referred to. Um, the most prevalent view or form of this view is called the framework hypothesis. And basically this view says that the days of Genesis are in fact a literary. Um, they're not referring to historical 24-hour days, that they are a literary device designed by Moses, the author of, you know, the very beginning books of the Bible, that, that he developed this literary device um, in order to express spiritual truths. And again, the problem with this view is, is there's no textual evidence whatsoever that that Moses intended this account to be taken in any other way other than as a historical narrative. Um, there, there's no textual evidence that he intended any other interpretation. This, as Moses writes, is the same type of writing that you would find in any other Old Testament historical narrative. And so the only way you can get to a framework view is by uh, importing certain assumptions about how you approach the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis. And, and you've got to kind of overlay these assumptions onto the text because there's nothing there within the text that, that would invite you to, to get to this conclusion on its own. Um, so there's some challenges, of course, with that. And there's also a view that, that is similar to that that's known as the revelatory day uh, or the revelatory day theory. And that is that the, the days of Genesis don't refer to the reality of creation. It was in fact uh, in six days that God revealed it to Moses, the way in which the world was made. So, so as Moses is explaining it, he, God explained to him on one day about this. And then God explained to him on another day about this, and so on and so on for six days. And, and that's where those six days uh, potentially came from. Um, again, certainly some, some weaknesses in that, um, but these are the, the primary views that are 
competing for our attention within um, evangelical circles. And then, of course, alongside of that, I would say, is the older and, and probably what I would say is still the, the dominant view, which is, is simply that as we read Genesis 1, that these are six 24-hour days. Now, let me just say one thing about these days as, as we approach this kind of issue. Um, I will always suggest caution when we try uh, to accommodate current scientific theory in our attempt to interpret Genesis 1. And here's why. Science is in a constant state of flux. It is changing continually as they learn more. Uh, a great example of this is that at one time, it, it was believed that, that, that the universe, after the Big Bang, you know, you had this explosion, science would say, everything, and, and, and as things go out, you, you got all this energy, all this matter, all this mass, and all this heat. Well, after a period of time, it begins to cool. And as things cool, what happens? Well, they begin to shrink. And so for a long time, that was the operating theory. Well then, all of a sudden, that gets flipped on its head. Because now it's believed that, you know, the universe is still expanding, right? It's, it's not shrinking. And, 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 you know, that's going this way and now going this way. I mean, you, you can't get more opposite than that. And if you had hitched your theological wagons to that, that, that first idea that the universe was shrinking, cooling, then you kind of end up, so to speak, with some egg on your face, and you look a little foolish when science changes and says, nope, nope, we're going this other direction, right? And so we have to remind ourselves that part of science is theory, just as part of medicine is practice. You learn as you go. And we're still learning a lot in both realms, if we're truthful about it. But wherever you fall, we must always be mindful that, that throughout the Bible, it takes the creation of the world seriously as a historical event. And if it's not a historical event, there is absolutely, absolutely no, no spiritual comfort that we can take from the things that are asserted in the pages of our Bibles. But we also need to remember as we, we do that and as we examine this and think about this and talk about this, we need to remember that when we are looking at creation through the eyes of Moses, we have to look at creation through three massive barriers. Um, the first barrier is the barrier of Noah's flood. Um, you don't have to be a, a brilliant scholar to read Genesis 6 through 9 and come to the conclusion that something changed about the way that the world works from before the time of Noah to after the time of Noah. And so the world before Noah and then the world after Noah, it's different, right? And, and it would be foolish of us to read the, the post-Noah world into the pre-Noah world. Yet, sometimes we get caught up doing that. The second barrier um, that we have to read the creation through, of course, is the fall, frankly. And, and none of us, not, not a one of us, can take off our glasses as, as fallen human beings and study Genesis in a vacuum. We all study Genesis 1 on this side of the fall. And we shouldn't underestimate the impact of the fall on us and on our understanding of that. And, and we can't try to superimpose our experience in a fallen world on the world that had yet to experience sin. It, it's ultimately impossible for a fallen being to take in accurately and, and comprehensively the reality of the fallen world. And then finally... The last thing is we need to remember that there is the barrier itself of the sixth day. When Moses was describing to us Abraham's meeting with God um, in Ur of the Chaldees, Moses was describing what a man heard from God. When Moses was describing 
the first five days of creation, he was describing something that, that no man saw, right? No, no human was witness to that. And so Moses was not only giving us a secondhand account of a human experience, he, he's giving us God's account of an experience that, that no human ha had ever had, right? Um, and so that's, that's what he's doing when he tells us these first five days. And so as we read this passage, it seems fairly clear to me that, that Moses thinks that the days he is speaking about are just like the days as we experience them. Now, if you choose to think otherwise, my suggestion is it takes some pretty compelling evidence to move us there, right? Um, it, we have to have some pretty compelling evidence for us to think other than, than Moses. We can't simply choose one of these other theories just because that's easy or because it helps us avoid confrontation. There should be some compelling evidence that, that moves us to that place. And, and, and the good news, though, is that where you land on, on the length of time of creation doesn't determine whether or not you are a Christian. We need to be clear about that. The thing of primary importance is our understanding that God created. Because without that, everything else falls apart. So we need to keep that in mind. It's important that we understand what we believe about creation beyond that. But the key, the linchpin to, to all of the rest of Scripture is understanding that God created and believing in that. So we can work on the rest. We can talk about the rest. We can debate about the rest. We can disagree about the rest and still love one another and still be Christians. Now, having said all that by way of introduction, let me just point your attention to the days themselves. I read them a little moment ago in scripture. If you've got your Bible, keep it open there to Genesis 1 or exclusively in that, that passage of scripture there in Genesis 1. Two weeks ago, I mentioned that the first three days of creation show us God giving the world form. And then the, the last three days, days four, five, and six, show us God filling the world, bringing fullness to emptiness. And, and this impresses us with the fact that the creation itself is stamped with God's character. If you're following along, look at the first day in verses 3 through 5. God's sheer power is expressed in this first day. God says, and it comes into being. Maybe you've heard uh, the expression, um, creation by divine fiat, right? Fiat, the same word that's used for that European car, right? Fiat. That comes from the Latin word, of course, fiat. And the first words in the Latin Vulgate of this section of this day are fiat lux. Let there be light. God said light into being. Can, can, can you fathom that? He said light. And there it was. Light. And boom, it happened, right? This stresses the sheer power of our God. By eight simple commands, Moses says that God spoke all of reality into being. That's a pretty awesome thought. By these eight words, God spoke the entirety of the universe into being. Wow, if that doesn't maybe even give you a, some chills, you might want to reach down and check your pulse, right? There is no question that God is bigger than this universe. He speaks it into being. He dwarfs this universe, which stands in, in great contrast to those who would believe that the universe dwarfs both us as well as God. 
that when God speaks, it comes into being. And it is good. And I want you to also note that, that immediately on the first day, there is an emphasis on the dividing of day and night. Look, look at verse 4 if you got your finger in your Bible there. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. There is an immediate emphasis on division, on differentiation in the creation. Part of God's ordering of the creation is seen in his dividing or the differentiation of creation. You'll see this in verses 6 and 7 when, when he differentiates between the waters above and, and the waters below. You'll also see it in verses 14 and verse 18 where he differentiates between the day and the night, the sun and the moon. You see this later on in scripture. You see it about in, in the law in Leviticus chapter 20 verse 25 where we see the Lord again adding differentiation even into his law. And so, so God makes distinctions, and, and those distinctions, those divisions, those differentiations are the way in which he creates order. He creates structure. He organizes his creation. Now look at verses 6 through 8. It's the second day, right? And on that day, God, we are told, transforms chaos into order by differentiating, by distinguishing, by dividing the waters from above and the waters below. This day recounts the, the creation of the sky, that is the expanse or, or the heaven it is called. The separation of the heavenly waters from the earthly waters by the sky. Now, honestly, I have no idea what he's talking about here when he's talking about the heavenly waters. I mean, I, I've read different commentaries about it and whatever. I don't have the answer to that question. I have no idea. I've never seen heavenly waters. It's, I, I, he means something there. I don't know what he means. But it's, it's, it's waters that are above the sky. Anyhow. But he speaks of God bringing a, a differentiation into the world breaking it apart, dividing, separating, differentiating, dividing the waters below from the waters above, the creation of the heavens. Pretty cool. And I want you to note also that already by the second day here, you see kind of a, a six-part formula to each day. And it repeats itself over and over. First of all, there's an introductory word, and God said, or, or, or then God said, depending on how you read it. Secondly, there's a, a creative word where God says, let there be, right? Let there be light. And then third, there's this fulfillment word, and it was so, indicating that what God had spoken into being had in fact been created testifying to the effectiveness of his sovereignty and power. And then fourth, there's a, a lordship word where, where God names the thing that he has created. And I want you to note at the very beginning of this narrative that, that God shows his lordship in the naming of things that he makes. That's very important when we come to the creation of man as well. Fifth, there is a commending word in all but one of these days. And that commending word was, and it was good. And even then on the sixth day, it says then, and it was very good. Indicating that God's creation is essentially good. And then there's a, a concluding word which ends with a phrase that says, and there was evening, and there was morning. And then... That happens, you know, day after day after day. And God uses this as this process to transform chaos into order by bringing his structure into his creation. Now notice on the third day, verses 9 through 13, 
we see the description of, of God's formation of the seas and the land. And again, God is shown on this day to be ultimately responsible for the earth's productive powers, right? Beginning on this day, the third day, the emphasis shifts from God, God ordering things to God filling his creation. But even in the filling of his creation, his, his awesome power is seen. In this day, we are told that he gives the earth the power to reproduce. Notice in verse 11, And God said, Let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. Up until this point, apparently all of creation has been special creation in the sense of, of God himself immediately bringing it into being. Now, he's going to use the earth itself to bring into being other things, like trees and plants and such. Even here, though, we see that the, the earth's ability to produce things comes only and directly from God. And so Moses makes it clear that, unlike the people in his day who worshipped the earth or or the people even in our day, like many in the, the New Age movement that are worshiping Mother Earth, Moses makes it clear that, that Mother Earth in and of herself doesn't have the power to procreate. Only God gives the Earth the power to bring into being other things. And so even in this word we see Moses showing God's sovereignty over all of the earth. Then on the fourth day, we see that, that God is sovereign over the, the markers that order our lives. There the, the sun and, and the moon are created. And, and isn't it interesting? In Moses' day, by many, the, the sun and the moon were objects of worship. People at Moses' time worshipped the sun and the moon. And you can understand why. The sun and the moon ordered everybody's lives. Um, there was no, you know, wonderful lights and electricity back then. When the sun went down, that was it. The day was over. Work was over for the day. Candle power or oil-powered lamps, that, that, that's all that you had. And so the sun and the moon ordered life. They ordered the seasons. Uh, they, they were... They were what, you know, governed so much of life. And because of that, people in those times worshipped them. But again, in Genesis 1, verses 14 through 19, on the fourth day, it's made clear that the sun and the moon are not gods to be worshipped. In fact, they are God's gift to us to help order our lives. They're not powers over us. They're simply markers. God uses three words. They are signs. They are for seasons, and these signs and seasons are there to give us order and to give us structure. They govern only in the sense of providing markers for us, not in the sense of being powers over us. They are signs. They are seasons, and they separate the day from the night. And, and and it's in this passage uh, that we get one of my favorite things here. It's right at the very end uh, of verse 16. After making the sun and after making the moon, it tells us that God also made the stars. You see that there? The ESV just has dash and the stars. But many others say, and also the stars, or the, and the stars also, depending on your interpretation. And, and it says there at the end of verse 16, like, it, it's so nonchalant. He made the sun. He made the moon. Oh, yeah, that's right. He also made the stars, right? Like, like that's, that's just some added in feature. You bought a new truck, right? And, and, and it has the four-wheel drive. And it has the towing hitch. And then the sale guy, sales guy comes and he goes, oh, yeah, it also comes with some floor mats, right? I mean... 
who just also's the stars. I mean, if if, if I made the stars, I, I'd be bragging them. You know, I, I'd be like, did you see my stars? My stars are awesome. I know the best stars. Did you see them? I made them. They're great. Right? I, I, I would be bragging about my stars. But But here in Scripture, it's added on as what, almost feels like an afterthought. And that is the magnificence of our God. The fourth day of creation teaches that that God controls the heavenly bodies and they are simply his servants. And then, of course, we get to the fifth day. The fifth day teaches us about the creation of the sea creatures and the birds as well. And again, it shows that God is sovereign over the most powerful earthly forces. The sea is a terrifying force in, in, in any time, but especially in ancient times. It's still, of course, a terrifying force to us. You know this is true. If you've ever been swimming, right, and you've had something unexpectedly brush your leg... We react like there is a freshwater shark about to take us out, right? How many of you have almost walked on water trying to run out of a lake when something brushed along your leg when you were swimming? And frankly, that's just the little things that live in our lakes. There's much bigger things in the oceans, right? And so the seas, they frighten us. And this passage is telling us that everything that is in the sea, in the oceans, in the sea, in all the waters, is merely a creature of God. God is in absolute control over it. It's all his servant. And then that, of course, brings us to the sixth day. Genesis 1, 24 through 31. There again we see the distinction that... that All of the creatures are created after their kind. But man, man uniquely is created after God's image. It says, in our image, in fact. And it says that over and over again, these days of creation, God's creation is characterized by various distinctions. He brings distinction between light and darkness, day and night, land and sea. Um, He brings dominion. There is order in his creation. And then on that sixth day, man is placed over all of the creation as God's servant. And it's all pronounced what? As very good. You cannot read the, the six days of creation and come away believing that the creation is itself evil that matter somehow is evil, or that the human body or or we are somehow evil. Everything that is brought into being by God during these six days is good. And and, and that is the way he designed it to be. He, He made it that way. In six days, it was good and it was very good. And that is designed to teach us that the problems of this world were not caused by God. Before sin entered in, it was all good. And then, we broke it. But that's for a different sermon. But this week, keep this in mind as you go about your week. About how God created all of this. About how God is sovereign over all of this. About how God is greater than all of this. And that God created it, and it was good. You see, God created it to bless us, to show us his love. That's why God created it and trusted us with it. The question is, what will we do with it? Think that over this week. Pray with me. God, again, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the chance to dig in here in scripture and just see just some of the amazing things that are packed into this wonderful book of Genesis. And God, I just pray this week, as we go about our week, that you would show us through your creation, your splendor, your glory, your beauty, 
your love for us. God, may we not take for granted what you have entrusted us with. We, we truly have been blessed. And we are thankful for all the beauty of all of your creation. For every day, every morning that we wake, is another chance to commune with you. Another chance for us to, to see you in your creation. To be awed by your might and your majesty. Lord, impress that upon our hearts this week. And God, as we go forth about the rest of our days, just continue to point us back towards you. How you've created all of this, that we might come to know you and be in relationship with you. What a beautiful, beautiful thing that is. We are so thankful for it. God, again, we're just humbled and amazed by your great love for us, sending us Jesus. And Lord, we continue to pray that his work would be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Strengthen us as we partner with you in that, as we pursue that. May we make much of you wherever we go this week. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, once again, we are truly thankful that you've stopped in and joined us for worship today. And if we can love you, serve you, bless you, pray for you in any way from Glory Baptist Church, Please drop us a comment, give us a call, send us a note, send us an email, and it would be our delight and joy to be a blessing to you, to share with you some of the blessing that God has bestowed on so many of us. And if you have any questions about Genesis or how the world was created or any of those things and you'd like some resources, don't be afraid to ask. We'd love to point you in the direction of some opportunities to learn and grow and maybe learn and grow along with you. We don't always have all of this figured out, even as pastors. We're still learning. We're still growing. And I would love to go on that adventure with you as well. So, as I love to say, stay awesome. Wash your hands frequently. Make much of Jesus always. And I do truly hope to see you soon. God bless. <laughs>